Hi, welcome to a new series of videos I'm making about the MGB GT. This time I'm going to concentrate on discussing the MGB in more detail and it'll be a multi-part series concentrating on a different topic in each video. Um, I'm going to make a video about the engine and drivetrain, the suspension and brakes, the bodywork and the interior of the car, um, but this first video is going to concentrate on the model history of the MGB. The MGB was launched in 1962 as a replacement for the outgoing MGA. The MGB carried over some mechanical components from the MGA, such as the front suspension and the design of the rear suspension. What was different about the MGB, and something that was praised for, was its new unitary body design that uh, incorporated a stylish look, as well as being uh, stiffer and stronger and lighter than the previous model. What was also carried over from the previous car was the B-Series engine, although it underwent significant changes to make it larger to 1.8 litres, and although it was more powerful, it was only marginally more performant than the MGA. This was in no doubt due to, in part due to the fact that the car was now wider by uh, a couple of inches, and which meant it had more frontal drag than the previous car. What was stark in contrast to the MGA though was inside the MGB. The MGB incorporated a lot of features which were really only seen on saloon cars at the time rather than sports cars such as wind up and down windows and um, door locks etc. And press at the time praised the MGB for it being a much more modern place to be as well as being more comfortable. The MGB was originally offered as a two-seater roadster. Um, and these early cars um, had some distinct differences to the later models such as different door handles and uh, offered with disc wheels as well as wire wheels as an option. Um, the roadsters were sold between 62 all the way to the end of production but from the beginning of production there was always a closed coupe variant in mind and the GT model came on the market in 1965. So the early cars also came with a three main bearing engine um, and this uh, was replaced in late 1964 or at the launch of the GT, sort of 65, with a five main bearing engine. Um, and this was due to um, customer complaint of uh, the three main bearing engine suffering um, from sort of longevity issues. So, up to sort of 60,000 miles, people might start complaining about bottom end rumble and uh, the bearings sort of wearing out. Um, the five main bearing engine um, was supposed to remedy this and it does make the engine very reliable actually by having the five main bearings there you don't have any real issues unless it's done significant mileage um, but the three main bearing engine if it's looked after and not um, used uh, under sort of extreme circumstances uh, you can kind of get 120,000 miles out of them um, with you know good oil pressure still and it's not unheard of it's just um, for people who wanted to use the car like a sports car, uh, you'd wear the engine out faster and even though the three main bearing engine was uh, freer revving because of the less internal friction, um, the five main bearing engine was uh, better suited for sort of a, a customer's car who they might want to abuse it occasionally and uh, take it for a sportier a drive um, rather than something that would say last a short period of time but be freer revving maybe like a race engine or something and be discarded. Um, it was just better for the overall image of, um, of the car in terms of reliability and makes for a longer lasting uh, power plant. Between 62 and 65, there was actually another uh, coupe version of the MGB um, built by a Belgian coach builder um, called Jacques, I can't pronounce his surname, by the Kuhn or Kaun, and he produced this Kaun uh, Berlinette, which was a very attractive car and um, was reminiscent of, sort of the Aston Martins of the time, so similar to like a DB5 or something, but not quite as nicely styled. It was actually a Pininfarina design that um, was used for the uh, MGB GT, um, as you see today, um, and it's a very attractive car in my opinion, um, and people sort of liken it to either a poor man's E-Type, which I don't think is actually that accurate if you look at the sort of proportions of the car. Um, it's more like a, a mini DB4, um, the way that the 
bonnet and the coupe shape is there, whereas E-type is more sort of elongated and curvy. Um, now that is kind of a, a stretch of the imagination to liken this to an Aston Martin, but uh, the, the parallels do, do get drawn fairly often, so it's worth mentioning. Um, and the GT uh, in itself was um, very similar to the Roadster in terms of its engine and drivetrain, uh, still retaining the three uh, synchro mesh um, gearbox um, where you don't have a synchro on first um, and all the interior does seem very similar but with the addition of two rear seats. Now these rear seats are um, for occasional use uh, for small children or luggage only um, but they do provide that additional practicality. Another innovative feature for the GT was the tailgate so rather than having a uh, closed boot like in the Roadster it's actually a sort of lift hatchback that you have there, probably an early version of the sort of modern hatchback that you see in cars today. Um, and the, the gate, the tailgate is kind of held up by these two quite robust springs rather than sort of gas struts which weren't available at the time. Um, other differences for the GT, so I mentioned that the engine and the gearbox were very similar to the Roadster, but something that was introduced for the GT was a, a different um, rear axle. So all of the uh, rear axles on the GTs were the later, I think, Salisbury type, whereas the uh, earlier Roadsters had a different uh, axle. Um, they're sometimes known as the uh, Salisbury, and I think the Banjo axle, um, and, th and that means that the, the actual differential itself on the earlier Roadsters um, was a sort of shape of a sort of Banjo, and they're actually favoured by a lot of racers because um, you can change the uh, final sort of drive um, ratio of the differential um, without having to take um, the rear axle to bits, you can take the, the cover off and you can actually sort the gears out, whereas the uh, Salisbury axle you do need to change, you do need to sort of dismantle um, the axle a bit to be able to get to those, remove those gears and, uh, and change the final drive ratio. So this, this particular car is a 1967 and um, from 65 to early 67 um, these are known as the Mark 1 GTs and they do have some differences to the later models as I mentioned one being the three synchro mesh gearbox we also have uh, different style um, A pillars so on the outside there are these little chrome um, sections mine aren't chrome anymore mine have been painted body colour I don't know if there's because that's trim that's been um, knocked off or gone missing or if the actual chrome itself has been painted over I'm not sure but these are only found on the Mark 1 GTs so late 1967 was probably when we'd say the arrival of the, the MGB Mark II um, and this was a bit of a difference to the Mark I's where they updated the gearbox to a full synchro mesh gearbox and that meant that the transmission tunnel on these later cars is actually a bit wider. Um, the earlier cars known as sort of a narrow transmission tunnel with like a lump on the top whereas the later cars are much more sort of wider tunnel with a flat top. Um, and that's to accommodate the sort of stronger gearbox, a more sort of civilised gearbox doesn't make as many whirs and whooshing noises and crunches when you try and get into first gear, it's, it's a lot easier to use than the, the earlier one. Um, the other things that changed in the Mark II were the um, quirky bits of the Mark I kind of disappeared, so as I mentioned the A-pillar trim uh, went away, um, and we got things um, as standard like reversing lights uh, and that kind of thing which this car doesn't have any reversing lights at all and um, so it just became a more civilized car still very much the same in terms of its construction and um, its overall performance just making it slightly more modern for the more sort of modern customer rather than just a, um, a carry-on of the technology from the MGA in some regards. So the Mark II MGB um, in late 1967 um, was also the first car to offer an automatic transmission for um, the MGB um, and it was actually um, liked by sort of, uh, the road test magazines of the time um, and 1967 was also the first year that the MGC was introduced so very similar to the MGB um, but used a 3 litre straight 6 engine rather than a 4 cylinder um, and a different sort of front cross member to accommodate the engine and different bonnet as well because it was slightly taller it had to be have a bulge in it to, to get it under there um, and it's actually a very nice car the MGC I mean I would like to have one actually as a, a sort of a, a gentleman's GT 
a cruiser rather than an out and out sports car. Um, unfortunately for the MGC it didn't receive very positive reviews when it first came out because um, people complained about the handling. With uh, modifications these days you can get MGCs uh, handling very very nicely indeed so it's kind of a not very warranted criticism nowadays of the MGC but at the time I think it made the sales of them suffer um, which is why it only lasted a couple of years I think it only lasted till 1969 the MGC um, and then uh, they were gone um, which makes them quite a bit rarer than the MGB today and that's reflected in the price of them they seem to be at least sort of twice the value of, of an MGB um, in GT form I'm not sure about the roads the prices but You'd, you'd pay a lot more for one over an MGB just because of the rarity and the performance improvement that comes with them. A final note about the Mark II MGB, so late 1967 to um, the end of 69, um, was the fact that it changed from a positive earth um, and dynamo sort of charging system to a negative earth one, and that meant that the charging rate for the battery was much improved, um, and a lot of people for the earlier cars to change over to a, um, a negative negative earth system. This particular car still says positive earth on the um, rev counter because it's a Mark I GT, but it does in fact have the um, upgraded uh, alternator and negative earth system and I've had the, well, the previous owners had the uh, electrics redone for um, negative earth. Maybe that's the cause of my erratic um, speedo, um, I mean rev counter reading that I've mentioned in previous videos um, but certainly it says positive earth on there but it's a, it's a negative earth car. Um, so people kind of describe the Mark II MGB as being uh, possibly the sort of golden age of the MGB in terms of its um, classic styling so still um, with the original um, wire wheels as an option um, with the uh, sort of spinners keeping the wire wheels on there, um, as well as having the uh, the nice sort of black crackle black dash and uh, sort of the real sort of old school charm, um, but also with the more modern things like the four synchro gearbox, reversing lights, negative earth system. So late '69, early 1970, um, the next generation of MGB came out, um, and this was more of a dramatic uh, facelift for the MGB. So the first thing that people noticed about these cars between 1970 to 72 um, was that the front grille uh, was dramatically changed. So no longer did we have a nice sort of chrome slatted grille. We now had a sort of recessed black grille. Um, but if you notice on those cars, um, where on earlier cars you've got an MG badge um, in the middle of the grille at the top, the bonnet pressing um, actually has a lump there to accommodate sort of the back of this badge. Um, but these 1970 to 72 cars, even though they don't have the badge there because the badge is recessed in the in the sort of open grille, the bonnet pressing is still there for the original badge, so it looks kind of odd with this sort of lump on the top. Other changes for the time were that the chrome overriders now had a rubber face to them, um, which uh, meant that you wouldn't scratch them up as easily as uh, chrome ones, but maybe took uh, away some of the look slightly um, and instead of uh, disc wheels uh, with hubcaps or optional wire wheels you now had um, the Ross style or RO style wheels as standard and these don't have the spin-on type um, attachments like wire wheels do. We now have um, like four studs and bolts to fit them. Um, other changes um, which kind of keeping with the times of the 70s were well, that the leather seats now um, had gone and they were replaced by vinyl items which is very uh, sort of on vogue for the 70s um, and also the seats uh, reclined and I believe that's when the um, potentially when the headrests came as well so it's a good safety feature there for the for the 1970 MGB. People did like the facelifted stuff at the time for if they in terms of just buying the car but purists did complain that the sort of traditional MG grille had disappeared and certainly if you look at those cars now um, they're kind of uh, a Marmite car. Some people love the fact that the grille is a bit more recessed, they're kind of like a gaping mouth sort of style, similar to, well, kind of stretch your imagination a bit, sort of like a like an E-type sort of gaping mouth or a, a Cobra or something like that, um, rather than just like an in-your-face sort of like chrome 
grill people do tend to like it but other people don't like it so um, I think the value of those cars are probably a bit um, hit and miss um, I think obviously good examples will, will sort of stay um, uh, sort of quite high in the price range but not as desirable as a sort of uh, a, a Mark 1 or a Mark 2 MGB um, but certainly because they still retain the chrome bumpers albeit with the rubber faced overriders they still have the period charm that people look for in these cars rather than the later ones between 1970 and 1972 there was actually a sort of intermediate update to the MGB's interior um, so this was to incorporate a new uh, fascia and uh, face level ventilation which is sorely missing from the earlier cars I mean in mine I don't have any ventilation in here except for a little tiny flap for fresh air down here and a little bit of uh, uh, another little flap for a heater and we've obviously got these um, quarter lights as well um, but we don't have any sort of face level ventilation to cool you down and it's quite um, hard to stay cool in here I and mean, I'm sitting in here on a, a June um, summer's day and I am actually baking um, I'm keeping the windows slightly shut because I don't want too much sort of outside noise coming in um, but if you're driving along if you have the windows down you get buffeted by the wind and everything and face level ventilation is uh, something which would make that a lot more bearable in um, October 1972 the MGB reverted back to a more traditional radiator grill um, but didn't have the chrome slats that the earlier cars had it now had a black honeycomb mesh um, this actually looks quite nice it's uh, kind of combines old and new um, looks quite sporty however um, not everything uh, was sporty about this new variant of the MGB um, in most markets it remained unchanged uh, power wise um, but for North America due to tightening emission regulations the power had actually gone down to from 90 odd horsepower down to 70 odd horsepower and they were on a single carburetor I believe, I believe and I don't know too much about it this is a North American market and I'm not too familiar with that um, but these cars had a single carburetor and uh, were pretty dismal in terms of performance and a lot of the uh, American owners have actually upgraded to the standard for other market um, twin SUs um, and this was yeah, mainly due to tightening emission regulation um, and lack of development probably by British Leyland to keep the MGB's performance current um, with the times and, and really uh, a shame in most respects because um, it would have been nice to have seen the MGB with a more modern power plant as it sort of grew into its adolescence um, and would have been uh, a good car to sort of uh, keep um, in motorsport perhaps as well because um, what's really sort of missing from these these cars is that after the initial years of uh, the MGBs kind of competing at Le Mans and some of the um, other endurance races such as the Targa Florio and uh, the 12 Hours of Spa um, from probably 1966 onwards you don't really get MGBs in like mainstream motorsport and that's probably just because it wasn't um, competitive anymore so the sort of newer 911s and that kind of thing with similar sort of engines so the earlier 911s I think they had like 2 litre engines or something like that uh, and they were just dominating everything um, so it would have been nice to have had an MG up there sort of competing for, for different titles and uh, sort of the accolades that go with motorsport give the car some sort of uh, um, pedigree as such but um, they just don't have it because they, they, people kind of laugh about MGBs about being the sports car for the pe person who wants to go slowly and in fact I think for the North American market, I don't know if it was between um, whether it was from 1972 onwards or whatever, but it's something like it was only the, I think it was like the second slowest or third slowest car accelerating from 0 to 60 uh, available to buy or something like that. One was like a diesel um, estate um, and I, I don't even know what the 0 to 60 figures were for the for North American market car, but um, I don't know if this is true either, but people sort of say that in the advert or specifications for the car it said 0 to 60 and rather than a time it just said yes <laughs> which kind of gives you an indication of kind of how embarrassed people were about the, the performance of the MGB at the time. So in 1973 um, another variant of the MGB was uh, launched and this was the MGB GT V8 so only offered in um, GT form 
this new car featured a uh, aluminium blocked V8 um, which had a significant performance increase over the four cylinder model and barely weighed any more being an aluminium block. Um, it was three and a half litres uh, and fitted uh, under the standard MGB's bonnet. Um, this was um, down in uh, no short part to a guy called Ken Costello who was um, doing MGB V8s before uh, this official launch of um, the official sort of MG V8 and he'd been doing these conversions for a number of years and helped in the development of them. Um, and, but this car was uh, significantly more expensive than, than the MGB um, and was a real sort of competitor in terms of performance but not many were actually sold because of the higher price tag. Um, the, the MGB uh, V8 ran from 73 through to 76 and actually spanned uh, the change, um, a quite a major change to the MGB which came in 1975. So in 1975, uh, due to um, sort of accident legislation or something like that in America, um, which dictated that bumpers on a car needed to be at a certain height and every car had to be able to withstand a uh, five mile an hour impact uh, unscathed. Um, obviously with the chrome bumpers and uh, sort of headlights which are right at the front of the car uh, and being quite low down, uh, a five mile hour crash on a, a, an early MGB will mean that you'll have broken bumpers, broken lights, um, you know, maybe like broken bodywork or whatever. Um, so what they did is uh, for 1975 is fit the MGB with uh, firstly um, big black rubber bumpers um, which gave the MGB sort of crash protection at low speed um, but also in order to meet sort of the, the sort of height of the bumper um, that was required uh, the car's ride height was raised by approximately an inch um, and this didn't do much for the handling of the MGB. Um, these early rubber bumper cars, so 1975, actually carried over a lot of stuff from the previous year's MGB so inside you'll find the um, dashboard looking very similar to a 1974 car um, where you've got the overdrive switch on uh, the column stalk and you've got like the uh, like the earlier cars you've got this sort of like pod for your main instruments um, everything's very familiar um, in 1976 there was another change um, so from outward appearance the uh, the rubber bumper car looked pretty similar to 1975 models but inside the interior was uh, quite drastically changed and the dash was completely updated so in America again I think the, the dash layout was different to the UK but I used to have a 1980 model MGB GT and the interior was far far different to the earlier uh, MGBs uh, we had um, a kind of a sort of flat plastic display with more modern instruments, uh, an electric clock, um, as well as uh, the overdrive now being a switch on the gear stick. Um, also these uh, sort of later rubber bumper cars, 1976 uh, onwards, uh, featured an engine bay which was almost identical, I think it might have been identical to the MGB GT V8. So if you're considering doing a V8 conversion to a car, be aware that a 1975 rubber bumper car won't have the same space in the engine bay as a 76 onwards rubber bumper car um, and in fact the 76 rubber bumper car is the ideal candidate for a V8 conversion because it has the um, the right size transmission tunnel so if you remember the earlier cars have a narrow one so you can't get a, like a beefy transmission in there um, but also has the bigger well, sort of wider engine bay um, as compared to like a 1975 or earlier car so the, the V8 engine should go in a lot easier. Um, the other thing that changed for these later rubber bumper cars was that the the seats were different so um, you have these sort of deck chair style uh, fabric seats. Um, the GT that I had was uh, sort of like a grey black and blue sort of stripy deck chair affair um, but there were some more vibrant colours so orange and brown and that kind of traditional sort of 70s mix of autumnal shades were were, um, were present. Um, 
and other modern features as well such as uh, dual circuit brakes were also featured so the braking performance was uh, uh, a lot a lot better and safer so if uh, one part of the brake pipe corroded you still had the opposite wheels sort of uh, operational um, and also electric fans so uh, I'm not actually sure when the mechanical fans disappeared I believe it was for the rubber bumper um, like mini facelift in 76 um, but the, the rubber bumper car that I had certainly had an electric thermostatically controlled fan rather than a mechanical one um, and although this seems like a more modern touch it's another thing to go wrong so the first thing that happened on that car when I got it was that the thermostat broke and the car would overheat because the um, because the fan didn't come on it was only like a 40p fix to buy a new sort of thermostatic switch but I fear that um, because it had overheated like damage had already been done to the engine and actually one of the reasons for my first MGB GT um, having an engine replacement was due to the fact that the cylinder head had warped due to overheating uh, so yeah a lesson there in uh, simple mechanics over complex electronics there I think um, so yeah this uh, this rubber bumper model continued through to the end of production in um, uh, October 1980. There were some uh, limited editions right at the end of production so for the um, UK market we got the LE, uh, the LE Roadster was offered in like this nice uh, bronze colour with um, quite nice looking sort of Dunlop alloy wheels and there was a, uh, a GT model um, limited edition as well which was a really nice car actually. I, I really like the limited edition um, MGB GT, even though it does have the rubber bumpers, yes, um, but it is finished in this nice pu metallic pewter colour and has a nice um, sort of decal down the side, uh, sort of a Union Jack with an MGB logo in there, and uh, it also has, I think, a, um, a front like chin spoiler or splitter type thing, sort of to make it look a bit more modern. I mean, it was, it was too little, too late really to sort of give the car like a mini sort of. Uh, modern facelift by then and people had sort of moved on to hot hatches and things because the Golf GTI came out in the late 70s and was sort of revolutionary at moving people away from uh, what was perceived as an unreliable uh, low performance sports car such as this onto um, reliable, practical and quick um, hatchbacks um, which were you know, sort of far better for, for everyday use and could carry the shopping and the children and everything um, as well as be a fun weekend toy um, all in one um, <clears throat> so that was kind of it that was the end of the MGB uh, production wise but actually thinking about the MGB's legacy um, it was uh, sort of Britain's most popular sports car loads of them were made there was really popular worldwide or especially in North America lots of them got sold there I think it's something like a quarter of a million of them um, got sold um, which is out you know sort of astounding considering that um, it's a sort of you know a sports car sports cars don't really sell that well um, compared to you know more mainstream cars um, and the legacy that's kind of been left behind is a real uh, strong um, sort of club level sort of following so you've got uh, the MG car club you've got the MG owners club as well as sort of other organizations that operate um, spares are uh, really widely available you can pretty much build uh, a, a brand new MGB if you wanted to you could get the body shell a lot of the trim pieces you can still get some stuff is uh, no longer sold so you'd have to sort of find um, uh, some way of getting to a breaker's yard or some sort of uh, you know uh, a dismantler who can sell you the the parts that you need or start up a project car or whatever um, and actually the MGB is really important um, for enthusiasts who want to get into classic cars um, because for a long long time, less so now actually as times have sort of moved on but certainly when I was first looking to buy a classic car um, the MGB is a lot of people's first classic sports car because it was affordable and the spares are there it makes the transition from going from a, like a, a normal car to a classic car that much more easy because you can maintain these uh, easily and at a relatively low cost as well as having a, a relatively low initial purchase price um, my rubber bumper MGB when I bought it back in 2004 I think or 2005 um, I bought that and that was probably as near to 
like mint original condition as you could get. Um, there were like the tiniest things that were wrong with it. Like I said, the, the thermostat broken. And I did have trouble later with uh, that engine blowing up and having to get a new one. But everything else was super reliable. And uh, even though, yes, it was a, a rubber bumper model, I, I had a, a classic car, which and I think I paid two and a half thousand pounds for it. And I held on to it um, for a couple of years before I, I went off to do a, a ski season and sadly had to sell it. But I sold it for the same price that I bought it for. I probably should have held out and got more actually. I think the guy um, didn't even haggle the price. He was super pleased with what he got. And because the car, the car had been, um, it wasn't wax oiled, it was uh, Z or Zybarted, um, similar sort of thing from new, the condition of the original panels was uh, really, really good and the interior was, was pretty much unmarked. Um, I didn't really know what I had, I guess, at the time. Um, um, but yeah, so uh, super easy to get hold of them um, then. I mean, less so now because they are a bit more sought after, especially the chrome bumper ones. So the prices have gone up a bit in line with every other classic that's out there. Um, and I think as people are, um, sort of generations are moving on, people are less interested in 60s and 70s sports cars they're more interested in uh, what they grew up with on the telly so potentially sort of your 80s um, hot hatches or supercars and even 90s stuff uh, and JDM type um, legends I guess people are starting to get into those as their sort of classics um, whereas these are, are becoming rarer and um, still highly sort of sought after but um, not with a, a younger generation um, but still I love mine um, I'm going to hold on to this as long as I can this is my this is my uh, my project my pride and joy um, I don't think people always say this but I don't think I'll ever sell it if I don't have to um, and yeah it's uh, it's almost part of the family I guess um, so yeah that's it as a sort of model history and a bit of an insight into um, my sort of history of the MG. I mean, I guess the other thing I didn't mention was I did actually have another MGB GT 1975 model, which was a complete rust bucket that I bought off of eBay, and it was kind of a, a rat rod kind of look that I had going on there for a while. Um, and it was a, it was supposed to be a, a car that I was going to do a Sebring or Sebring conversion on with the wide arches and things like that, but it was a, a complete basket case, and I, I swapped that in the end for uh, a more standard um, classic. MGB, uh, so this one, this is the one I replaced it with, and that one actually ended up being a donor car for a uh, Morris Traveller um, B series upgrade or something like that. Um, so it didn't go to a great home because it wasn't a great car to start with, but um, yeah, it was quite sad to see that one go. Actually, I would have liked to have seen that project through to completion, and in fact, I would quite like to still to do a um, sort of like a beefy MGB GT, sort of like a V8 powered one, or um, people talk about, you know, those uh, SR20 DT swaps that you can do. Um, people have done LSs and that sort of thing as well. But um, yeah, maybe something if I ever get a garage, I could do a project like that. But yeah, hope you like the uh, the model sort of history overview. And uh, yeah, I'll be bringing out the next um, next one in the series of these um, sort of in detail videos uh, relatively soon. So yeah, thanks for watching and bye.